you know, need roads because communists walk. So, yikes, right? Down, darn, darn are the reality of our situation. But this road thing, we have to start at the road thing because it is the most ridiculous. It's not ridiculous if you understand that they're just trying to take control of everybody. But no new roads and the implications are were swiftly um, understood by premiers Ford and Smith, and they responded on social media right away. So Danielle Smith is actually the first time I saw it. And she says, now our environment minister wants to cut federal funding for roads because we should all just walk more. Does the minister understand that most Canadians don't live in downtown Montreal? Most of us can't just head out the door in the snow and rain and just walk 10 kilometers to work every day. Can we return to the real world, Minister Gilbo? And she's responding to this Western Standard article that was posted on February 13th yesterday. Gelbo wants municipalities to stop building roads, urges people to walk. So you're welcome, everybody. Who needs roads anyway, right? Psh, you, won't, you won't have enough money to afford an electric vehicle. Don't worry, by the time we outlaw gas vehicles. Great. <laughs> Doug Ford says, I'm gobsmacked. A federal minister said they won't invest in new roads or highways. He doesn't care that you're stuck in bumper to bumper traffic. I do. We're building roads and highways with or without a cent from the feds. So that's, I mean, that's interesting, right? They're going to build roads and highways, says a gobsmacked Doug Ford. Um, and the newspaper article he's sharing is Montreal Gazette. Electric vehicles, not a panacea for climate change. So not a cure-all for climate change, right? Sue MacArthur is sharing this one from the Toronto Sun. Minister of Environment Galbo stated, quote, our government has made the decision to stop investing in new road infrastructure. Your government's not going to lie. If you stop, in, if you send all of the money to Ukraine and you stop building things as basic as roads, you're probably not going to stay in office long. Hopefully, fingers crossed, holy smoke. I mean, they've already been in office a lot longer than I anticipated. Um, we should use transit, they say. Do you understand that transit uses roads? <laughs> Walk or cycle is our means of transportation. How does this work for rural and suburban dwellers? Yeah, great questions. People are incredulous of the stupidity of this minister. Or, I mean, out of touch, isn't it? The outright attack on people's regular everyday lives. That's... I can't believe it, right? It's it's unbelievable. It's jaw-dropping. You wouldn't consider somebody saying, you know what we've got to do? No more 401 expansion. I know we're importing a million people a year. Great. No more 401 expansion. No more roads. No more anything like that. Everybody just walk, right? Stay where you are and walk. Horse and wagon, right? If you need to move long distances. Um, roads, they'll be impassable. You need a, a big wooden wagon wheel to get through, right? <laughs> Unreal. Uh, Billy says this, this is brilliant, and he tags gas price wizard, and this is a meme. So it says, imagine we lived in a world where all cars were EVs, and then along comes a new invention, the internal combustion engine. Think how well they would sell a vehicle half the weight, half the price, that would almost quarter the damage done to the road, a vehicle that could be refueled in one-tenth of the time and has a range up to four times the distance in all weather conditions. It does not rely on the environmentally damaging use of non-renewable rare earth elements to power it, and uses far less steel and other materials. Just think how excited people would be for such a technology. It would sell like hotcakes. Yeah, sure would. <laughs> sure would. Absolutely. Doug Ford says, now more than ever, we at every level of government needs to be doing everything they can to put more money back in your pockets. He says, scrapping the federal carbon tax needs to be at the top of the list. So Doug Ford's on the attack about roads. We need to build those still because you know that's the basic in infrastructure that makes businesses able to be accessed, makes schools able to be accessed, makes everything go. Although, you know, if you can't get to school, maybe you just got to homeschool and everybody just does that. So that's interesting too. Um, but fundamentally, it is a betrayal of the government to make these proposals. And I think it's a betrayal of the government to tax the air in the form of CO2 tax, to tax the energy across the board, to do what it's doing. And I'm glad that Doug Ford is saying now that we really should scrap that tax, but there's a whole bunch of other taxes that we really should scrap. And we really should get back to focusing on Canadians in Canada rather than wholesale sending tax dollars to the Ukraine, printed tax dollars, uh, saved up tax dollars, billions, hundreds of millions of dollars, whatever it is um, to Ukraine. We're sending money to the Philippines, $5 billion to the Philippines, and now another 30 million. I'll show that to you as well. Um, but we have to stop doing that. We have to stop. There's no there's no excuse for it. We have to stop with the 10 cities. We have to deport the people who are here illegally. We have to figure out a way to deal with the people who have 
who have arrived here and who are causing chaos. Like we should really fix the problems that have been created by these lax policies. But Doug Ford, I mean, at least he's talking about the taxes, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We should scrap the carbon tax. There's nothing else to talk about, I guess. It's fine, but it's just not nearly enough, right? It's just not nearly enough. Here's what I was talking about before. Wide Awake Media says Dutch political commentator Eva V um, says that unelected globalists are using cl a climate scam as a pretext to shut down the global farming industry, leaving people no option but to eat insects and lab-grown meat under the banner of UN Agenda 2030. The people behind this want to establish a one-world government, a new world order, which in which they decide what we eat, when we eat, where we travel, and when we travel, who we meet, and what we are allowed to spend our money on. Basically, they control control over every single aspect of our lives. They don't want us to eat foods that make us strong. They want us to eat synthetic meats created by Bill Gates. They want us to eat bugs. They want us to drink soy milk. And they, so they, we become weak and obedient and we do as they say. So um, it's a three and a half minute speech. Otherwise I would have just let her say all that. But I think that that's like spot on, right? Link is in the description if you want to see the whole thing. Um, the, the important part of that is the people in charge are using the climate change lie as a pretext to take over. They are trying to scare people into complacency. They're trying to scare people into being afraid of doing anything different, paying carbon taxes or anything like that. If you do that, this is this bad thing's going to happen. And so that prevents you from taking that action. Does that make sense? And so they're trying to use that pretext of the uh, disaster, the you know climate change disaster to force in their communist policies. And the communist policies aren't going to do a damn thing about climate change. And once the communist policies are set, people are going to forget about climate change and be struggling to survive. And, and I mean, nobody's going to do anything about climate change. What's the BC carbon tax been spent on? Nothing. It's, it's nonsense. No, and they've had a carbon tax since 2008. Nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Dan McTeague is talking about carbon and all of the related energy stuff. And he's responding to Dave. And he says, Dan says, I see Manitoba's new NDP government just fired their utilities CEO for not going along with their dangerous and costly net zero plans for the grid. Manitoba will fail financially and residents will pay a steep cost for this climate authoritarian authoritarianism. Um, and it's there's a lot of people who believe in uh, unrealistic solutions because they've never they've never had to deal with um, the reality of a situation. You know what I mean? Like power's always been on demand. The furnace is always turned on because there are, you know, um, people out there making it work, right? It's not, it doesn't happen by accident. And people think, oh yeah, well, we can just turn on, we could just store all that energy in a battery. Well, wind and solar don't make near, nearly as much energy as is stored in the oil and gas that we use to power everything. And if all you have is wind and solar, there are going to be people who freeze in the dark. And like, they don't get that. And I like fundamentally, they don't understand that that's a true statement, right? Like, so, I mean, people are going to have to learn the hard way if the media reports on it, because the media might not, right? CTV Edmonton is reporting this. We were blindsided. Edmonton seeking $82 million in damages from the U.S. company over electric buses. The U.S. company that they're seeking the damages from doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. Doesn't doesn't exist at all. Sorry about your luck, right? City of Edmonton, Kirk is talking about this. He says, City of Edmonton has decided to gamble taxpayer dollars on electric buses in spectacular fashion. Of course, they didn't study them or do any proper trial. The buses, which were supposed to have a 328 kilometer range, barely got 250 kilometers in the summertime and 165 in the wintertime. That's if they worked. Less than 50% of them worked at any given time, which wasted countless taxpayer dollars in upkeep as well. Now the city is trying to get back $82 million from a company company that no longer exists yowza right like that's not surprising whatsoever i'm not surprised by this when this happened i said this is dumb like <laughs> this is not going to work out well um and now that it hasn't worked out well that's bad right that's bad for the people of edmonton that's bad for everybody and it could have been avoided through i mean due diligence um basic due diligence a couple of a couple of really easy a couple of things that you, like bring a bus here right before we put in a hundred million dollar order or however much order Bring a bus here and we'll run it for a year and we'll see how, how, how great it works. If it works so great, we'll buy lots more. Could have done that. Didn't do that. Why not? Right? Here is Dane. And this is two minutes. This man breaks down climate change and the CO2 hoax with numbers. Watch and share. Hold on. I haven't actually watched this. Hold on.
Okay, so he takes a minute to break down the, the math of the trees, and he says basically that Canada absorbs 14 times. Here, here it is right here. Canada. One mature tree clears or absorbs 48 pounds of CO2 per year. This means 7.6 billion tons of CO2 are absorbed by trees every year. Now, it is estimated that 545 million tons of CO2 is produced in Canada every year, which means the trees in Canada, and I'm not talking about all the other vegetation other than trees. I'm not talking about that. We're not including that. Which means trees only in Canada absorb 14 times more than the carbon emission of Canada, and we are made to pay a carbon tax. So tell me again what it is about. Is it about climate change? It's not. If there's no CO2, we are doomed. There cannot be life without CO2. Now, let's talk about the U.S. There Okay, how do we don't need to talk about the US? It's just interesting to me. Like, it's obviously false. It's obvious the 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 whole idea of this thing is false. The government wants to tax the air, and they're coming up with a good story to to make you believe that taxing the air is a good idea. Okay, and they've sold that story, and now people are waking up to the idea that it's bad. But it's it's very very interesting to me how it's difficult for people to break out of this idea of the catastrophe this this impending catastrophe um i wish people were more ho more hopeful there's an imagine dragon song called symphony that i just heard this morning and it's wonderful so you should check that out it's a lot happier than stick season <laughs> so but yeah it's interesting it, it's interesting to me that if you dig into the climate change stuff um from everything from the average global temperature where is the average global te temperature located? What time of day is the average glo global temperature taken? Um, there's so many questions, right? Like, uh, but I digress. It's all bunk. <laughs> when you dig into it at all, it seems very flimsy. It doesn't seem like it holds up. The only thing that makes it seem like there's climate change is you go outside and it looks like, well, hey, it's February and there's no snow and it's kind of been rainy, right? And it's warm and it should be very cold in Ontario. And to me, my question is, what the heck are they spraying in the sky? And why is it not regulated? Like, why don't we stop it and see what happens when we stop all that spraying in the sky? Let's let's do that. Let's try that. Um, and why aren't we talking about that? And it just seems, you know, moves moves like firing the the um, person who doesn't want to go along with the net zeroing of the grid make make it seem like they don't want to have competent people in charge. They want their ideologically um, driven plans to be executed without any question or dissent, right? And so that's what's going on. And it's unfortunate, but I hope we're able to avoid the worst of the consequences of these dumb decisions that we seem to be making over and over again. Let's move on to Arrive Scam. I didn't even talk about Arrive Scam in the pre show. Just it's such a big scandal, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a huge scandal and it's still unfolding. Um, nothing concrete coming out yet. Uh, here is Concerned Canadian. He says, where's Trudeau? Too busy to attend the House of Commons question period. Oh, that's right. He's in hiding, avoiding another scandal. So this is back and forth between Pierre Polyev and the government leaders talking about the Arrive Can scandal. I'll just play the first minute uh, because, yeah, just to give us a temperature of what's going on in the House of Commons. Here we go. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. To deal with the crisis of doubling housing costs and 22 million people forced to food banks, the Prime Minister could have followed our common sense plan to axe the tax, build the homes, fix the budget and stop the crime. Instead, he blew fifth, sorry, over $60 million on an Arrive scam app that we didn't need, didn't work, sent 10,000 people erroneously into quarantine losing income, all the while the thing costed 750 times more than the Prime Minister promised. Won't he stand up today and admit that the app is just like him? It's not worth the cost, it's not worth the corruption. Yeah, yeah. The Honourable Minister for Public Safety. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition knows very well that the moment there were allegations around cost overruns or inappropriate contracting practices, the Canadian Border Services Agency immediately began an internal audit and made the Absolutely. appropriate referrals to the appropriate authorities. We take the obligation to manage taxpayers' money very seriously. Under no circumstances would we condone what the Auditor General determined to be contracting practices that did not follow the rules, and anybody who didn't will be held to account. Absolutely. Uh, not very believable, right? Not very believable. This is yesterday, the 13th, and Justin Trudeau's in the house. Cat Canada says Polyev delivers several 
phrasal uppercuts to Trudeau as they go toe to toe on the issue of the Arrive Can scandal and Trudeau's corrupt track record. Trudeau resorts to the tired accusations that conservatives peddle conspiracy theories. That's all they've got. <laughs> they, they can't excuse it. They just have to say, oh, yeah, well, he's not telling the truth. I, I think he is probably, right? And his Arrive scam are not worth the cost or the corruption. Right. After yesterday's Auditor General re revelations of corruption, waste and mismanagement, I have written the RCMP asking them to expand their criminal investigation into the Prime Minister's Arrive scam. He has a track record of blocking criminal investigations. He tried to protect SNC-Lavalin from prosecution. He blocked the RCMP from investigating his illegal vacation to Billionaire Island. Will he stay out of the way, or will he again try to block the RCMP's criminal investigation into a Arrive scam? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. The COVID-19 pandemic was a once-in-a-generation, even once-in-a-century occurrence in which every decision we took uh, was designed to protect Canadians' lives. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, even in a situation like that, there are rules that need to be followed, and we expect, and all Canadians expect, public servants to follow those rules, uh, and we will, of course, uh, encourage uh, the RCMP to do its work, but it doesn't take politicians, even leaders of the opposition, to tell the RCMP to do their job. They do their job, Mr. Oh, Speaker, and great. they do it well. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. They do their job unless the Prime Minister blocks them from doing their job, like he did in his criminal offence where he, he committed the crime of accepting a gift from someone who was seeking a government contract from him. He blocked the RCMP from investigating him. And, he, you know, COVID-19 is something he saw as a once-in-a-generation opportunity to fill the pockets of his friends, whether it was the Wee scandal, which he, in which his family received a half million dollars, or whether it was Frank Bayless, or now the Arrive scam. Will he stay out of the way and let the police investigate him and his corrupt government in, in Arrive scam? So back and forth and back and forth. And, you know, it's... It's very difficult to understand the corruption, the depth of the corruption, and watch the liberals stand there and, and continue to govern. Very, very annoying. Larry Brock says, breaking news, Canada's Freedom of Information watchdog confirms an open investigation into government officials at CBSA covering up documents related to ArriveCan. Destroying and withholding documents is a troubling concern in Trudeau's Arrive scam. And so there's the notice. And here is Holly Doan. She's reporting president of the Canada Border Services Agency. Erin O'Gorman says that she cannot account for disappearance of federal documents used in sweetheart contracting under the $59.5 million Arrive Can program. I, where's those, where are those documents? Oh, they were around here somewhere, I think, maybe. <laughs> so that's pretty, 59 million? I wonder how many other documents about how many other big contracts just go missing around, you know, this administration, right? Not just in the Canada Border Services, but any kind of work that's been done at all, right? At all. You've got a question at all, really. Lion Advocacy says, he's responding to OIC Canada. OIC Canada says, a stark illustration of the importance of prosperity document or properly documenting decisions in order to ensure transparency and safeguarding confidence in government decision making. And so Carolyn Minyard, and this is a meme, this is a text on a graphic, and she's the, Carolyn Minyard is the Information Commissioner of Canada in April 2020. She says, quote, when the time comes, and it will, for a full accounting of the measures taken and the vast financial resources committed by the government during this emergency, Canadians will expect a comprehensive picture of the data, deliberations, and policy decisions that determine the government's overall response to COVID-19. Canadians have a fundamental right to this information. They expect it they expect that it will be available to them and that the government will provide it. Um, so fingers crossed, right? Lion Advocacy says the information commissioner emphasizes the importance of properly documenting government decision making. Remember, folks, the government couldn't justify why the unjabbed weren't allowed on planes and trains. I think the government even went so far as to call it cabinet confidence. No, we can't tell you. It's really dangerous for you to understand what we know. But don't trust us. Don't go on a plane or a train with an unvaccinated person. <laughs> Don't look at any of the other evidence around the world. Only we tell, are telling the truth. Yeah, sure. Andy Lee is responding to Andrew Coyne. Andrew Coyne is musing. He says, prediction. Hmm. We are never going to get to the bottom of ArriveCan. Any, 
any more than we're getting to the bottom of the SNC Lavalin or the We Charity or the Winnipeg Lab Mess or anything else, our accountability mechanisms are just laughably weak where they're not, comp- uh, where they're not compromised. So they're compromised or they're weak. Andy Lee kind of responds. And like, this is something that I bang my drum about all the time. We don't have any accountability, not in public health, not at the municipal level, not at the mayor's level, not councillors, not city councillors, not school boards, not school board trustees, nothing, no accountability for anybody, right? Like nothing. These people lied to their citizens and said, this is safe and effective. They locked down the citizens, their citizens' entire economies while the federal government flooded the economies with money. And people said, this is going to lead to inflation. And everybody said, no, it won't. And they just made it rain, baby. And it was like, holy smoke, we're doing this the worst possible way we could do this, unless your intention is to destroy the economy a whole bunch, right? And and so um, we're never going to get to the bottom of it. The accountability, like, we haven't had any accountability in years, years. And I mean, we're, we're going back before COVID-19 as well. And I was talking about it in my show before then too. But the idea that like it, accountability is just around the corner. We've gone through elections where We Charity and SNC Lavalin were kind of like, you know, part of the story and people were scoffed at, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And Andy Lee says, you know, Andrew, I've already got to the bottom of the Winnipeg lab thing. It will never be openly investigated because former Prime Minister John Cretchen's brother, Michael Cretchen, worked with a Chinese person who was escorted out for security reasons. They published studies together. So yeah, it's not, we're not going to have any accountability. The corruption is unbelievably deep, unbelievably deep. Like even arrive can, I don't know that that's going to unseat the government. I don't know that that's going to create a situation where the government collapses and it should, it should, by all rights, it should, it's a big scandal. It should. Um, so should a lot of the other scandals that should have unseated Trudeau, but they haven't. So that's interesting to note. Um, and, uh, I was going to make another point, but I forgot. <laughs> oh yeah. Like basically the point is that I don't think we're going to see, like, we haven't seen any accountability for the previous scandals. And I don't think we're going to see any accountability for this one either. And Maxime Bernier agrees with me. Shocker. He says it's a scandal that $60 million disappeared in a black hole for the arrive can app. But don't forget that the liberals wasted hundreds of billions of dollars on all kinds of useless programs during COVID and did it with the support from the fake conservatives, the NDP and the bloc. This massive spending causes the inflation of the past few years and our skyrocketing debt. It makes all Canadians poorer. That's the real scandal that all establishment parties are responsible for. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Absolutely. And we are in a situation where, I mean, if we're not paying for Ukraine, we're paying for Israel or Palestine or some other foreign thing or um, shelter space for Toronto and Montreal or tent cities for our local municipality or shelter space for the local municipality. And we're being told that we're racist. We're being told that we're the ones who are intolerant. We're paying for all this. This is wild. Absolutely wild. How do we stop paying for all this? There are people talking more openly about tax revolts. They're talking about a legal way to withhold taxes because the government is is shirking its fiduciary responsibilities. I'm saying that fiduciary, 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 forget it. That one, I'm saying that word wrong. Um, But they're not doing what they should be doing with money. What they should be doing with money. It's like when Elon Musk bought Twitter, right? He said, how much to buy Twitter? And they said, billions. And he said, yeah, but how many billions? And they said, oh, 44 billion or whatever it was. And he said, okay, so that's each share this much. And he offered fair market. Now, and I think he offered like more than fair market, something to the effect of it would be irresponsible of them in the eyes of their regulatory body to ignore or not take that offer because that offer benefits the shareholders. And our government we're the shareholders and they're looking at offers and they're like, oh, so it'll tank the economy and force them to uh, force unvaccinated people out of grocery stores. Great. They can't do that. They're, they're acting against their own citizens. They shouldn't be able to do that. And there should be protections. That's a betrayal of the people. Right. And so there should be oversight. There should be something, something that says, no, you can't do that. Um, I don't know. But people are looking for it. People are talking about it a lot more, right? They're saying this part of the law says we could do this. Um, but, and, and again, I'm, who knows? But I think that if you could withhold your taxes and instead say, here's an IOU for when the government starts paying tax or starts spending the tax dollars that I remit in Canada rather than in the Ukraine, right? Here's, here's the IOU for when that happens. But before that, I'm not spending a dollar. Who knows? Who knows? People are talking about it. Here is City News and they're talking, let's talk about money. City News says Vancouver medical health officer says climate change 
puts many at risk. So this is, climate change is actually a health issue. And I think that that's funny. And I know that there's another, there's another thing talking about climate change being a health issue somewhere in here, but I, I don't know that that's in the right order. So we may come back to this again, but I think it's very interesting. The argument they're making here is climate change is a health issue. Climate change, health. You, they're absolutely trying to do exactly the same kind of lockdowns for your health comrade. It's the whole thing over again. It's wild. Have you heard of Alaska pox? First, city news. Vancouver Coastal Health Chief Medical Officer says every community within her region is at risk of harm because of the changing climate. Dr. Patricia Daly says these risks from climate extremes are different in each community under the authority, which encompasses 1.25 million people depending on geography and demographics. Now, hold on a second. I just have to like point out something. Like as you go up and down on the, what is it, latitude? As you go up and down on latitude, like you can see the snow line, like at this part of the latitude, this is the average temperature. You go further north, this is the average temperature. Further north, this is the average temperature, right? And people live at all latitudes. They don't live in Antarctica for reasons, wink. Um, but like they live at all latitudes, right? And sure, in northern latitudes, you might get a cold in the fall and the springtime because of the changing climate or whatever. Um, and there's certain things that could happen, like you could slip on ice, right, much more readily than if you live down further south in the latitude and you live in like Florida, right? Very, very unlikely that you're going to slip on ice in Florida, but you know, it could happen too. So this idea that oh my gosh, the weather's changing and it represents significant challenges to people. Nope. Nope. They're just lying. They're just openly lying. Like people live up and down that whole latitude line, right? And if you go around the world as well, like Toronto has on, in July, 30 degrees is not un, uncommon for a day. But in, in like, uh, I was going to say Abu Dhabi, in other parts of the world, in the capital of India, Mumbai, um, if you have, or New Delhi or whatever, whatever it's called, <laughs> which one, Mumbai or New Delhi at this point, it doesn't matter. Um, in India, let's say it's 40 degrees, right? And if you go even to the Middle East, it's like 45 degrees. And you know what's not happening? Like forest fires and things. I guess that they're deserts, but like people live there too, right? And like, is it a catastrophe? Doesn't seem to be, right? So like these people are lying. They're stoking fear and it just drives me. It just really grinds my gears. So anyway, they're saying maybe problems, you know, it could encompass 125 million or 1.25 million people, depending on geography and de demographics. In her first report since the COVID-19 pandemic, so you know it's going to be full of, chocked full of fear. Daly says climate change presents a range of health risks, including extreme heat. Extreme heat is a, a health risk? Wildfire smoke. Oh yeah. Flooding and droughts in public health. We know the exist. using the term we know is a signature or signatory that you're going to hear a lie in a minute. We know that the existential threat to our population is climate change. This is something that as medical health officers, our public health team have been working to mitigate climate change and adapt to the changes that we have been seeing for years now, said Daly. The purpose of this report is to look at local data important to the communities in the Vancouver coastal health region. So yeah, it's, it's a whole bunch of nonsense, a whole bunch of nonsense. And it is in addition to harming the people with uh, overly zealous public health who roll out public health um, orders, which really, I mean, should have no teeth whatsoever, but they do. Um, they're also giving our money to foreign countries. So they're taking, our, we, we are being treated in a tyrannical way by the institutions that we pay for with our tax dollars, like lockdowns and, you know, you unvaccinated person can't come here for all of our safety. You're unsafe for all of our safety. And we found out that was wrong. It was public health that was wrong. And they were telling us incorrect things about the safety profile of the medication they were forcing on everybody. Um, but and, and no consequences for that, right? Really, really wild stuff. Um, but in addition to all of that, they're taking our money and they're sending it to a foreign country. And Condo Chris says, we just gave the Philippines $5.3 billion for climate change. What the heck is going on here? Here's the reminder. In, on December 7th, 2023, Philippines get $5.3 billion with a B, climate change finance commitment from Canada. So I don't know if this is like the first $28 million or the first... $30 million or whatever, if it's an additional $30 million. But this is the agreement where they're getting $5.3 billion. And this is where Ahmed Hassan is celebrating. Hi, everyone. Sorry. Every, Ahmed Hassan is celebrating handing over 
$28 million. So this is a new announcement. Um, and this is February 13th. Rachel says, when we when we support cleaner and more inclusive future for the world, we're supporting people everywhere from the Philippines all the way to Canada. Our $28.15 million funding announcement for the Philippines will go directly to fighting climate change and increasing access to healthcare. Oh, I knew it. I knew I had a healthcare thing. It was right there. Okay. So, right? Climate change is healthcare and we're funding climate change and healthcare in the Philippines. Ta-da! Like, yay, you're so excited. We're so excited. Everybody's so excited. We're handing out billions of dollars in climate change and healthcare funding for foreign countries. Crazy town, right? Stephen's responding to this. He says, I know you may be going to bed hungry. I know you may be lying in bed at night filled with anxiety over making ends meet and maybe an impending mortgage renewal. Uh, but at least you can find immense comfort knowing your tax dollars are paying to fight climate change in the Philippines, right? So Hello everyone, thanks very much for watching. This is just a short version of a longer show. If you'd like to get the whole show, you can go over to canadapoly.com and sign up for a subscription. Just look in the drop down tab for shop and donate and look for subscriptions and you'll get immediate access to the full show. Love to see you. Thanks for watching everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful.